This is uh, Nicolas Alexiou from the Hellenic American Project uh, Queen's College and the Department of Sociology. And today in our series of um, oral history interviews, we are very happy, very pleased and very honored to have um, an interview with Mr. Guy um, uh, Cladis. Cladis. Uh, or Cladis. <laughs> in Greek. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, uh, we're going to examine, we're going to explore, uh, we're going to be in this endeavor of his, uh, his own life and also the family's life and of course uh, the very uh, renowned and well-known uh, painter Aristodemus Cladis who uh, was uh, your father. Uh, Mr. Cladis, uh, Guy, thank you very much for the interview today. And uh, let's start by, uh, you, uh, by saying your name and uh, where you were born and uh, where you grew up. Okay, I'm named Guy Constantine Caldas, Constantine after my father's favorite uncle, Constantine uh, uh, Christopoulos. My cousin uh, married a Christopoulos. Can you believe that? <laughs> so, but she never took his name. Anyway. Uh, my father uh, came here uh, to this country in uh, 1917 and uh, landed at Newport News on a, a freighter. Uh, he knew a lot of the people who were in shipping, so he probably got a free ride knowing my father. And uh, he eventually landed in Watertown, where he worked at a hood rubber company plant which during the war. You know, the war started for us in 1918 and finished in 1918, so uh, uh, we weren't in it very long. But he, he got involved in uh, uh, being an a, uh, interpreter and then got involved in politics, and then he moved to New York in the 30s. I know very little bit about him in the 20s, but in but, the 30s... But, uh, but where he came from? He came, okay, he was born in Dikili Arta Nefs, uh, Turkey, which is the port that you take to go to Lesbos. Uh, my grandfather was from Lesbos, Mytilene, and my grandmother, uh, Urania, was from Pergamon area. She had a farm there. And my father was born in 1899, uh, August 15th, uh, by the Turkish passport, which he used. Uh, he never had a Greek passport. Uh, and I found out recently from my cousin that he, his education mostly was in, you know, uh, Asia Minor. Uh, so uh, what happened is that uh, he, at, night, at age 14, he was thrust into one of the family's businesses, which was a shipping business, loosely affiliated with the Levanos family. And he hated it, absolutely hated it. It was... It was a big family though, right? Well, I, he was the... Uh, third child of four boys. There was uh, Pol Poly Polydactus, uh, there was Byron and my father, and the youngest was Christos. Uh, and Byron died at age 30, according to my father, which he never told me in a timely fashion with urinary problems. Uh, but uh, my cousin uh, by Christos is named Byron. You know his his son Christos' son Spiron. It is very striking that at a very young age of fourteen, yeah, he went into the shipping uh, uh, yeah. business. He hated it. He absolutely hated it. He said, "I don't believe in the physical world. I believe in the metaphysical world." Was his common statement. He went, and so he came to the United States, and uh, by freighter to Newport News and then worked his way up to uh, the Boston area. And uh, he was involved, you know, uh, in making boots. And I assume that that's how he got his American citizenship, by working in the war effort uh, for uh, making boots, the Hood Rubber Company. And he knew a lot of the radicals of the area. He knew Sacco and Vincetti. He actually was arrested, I found out, by misspelling his name five different ways in the New York Times. He was arrested for uh, a protest of the execution of Sacco and Benzetti. Uh He came to New York sometime in the 30s and uh, 
he uh, knew a, a woman, a Greek woman, who had been adopted as a baby by Isadora Duncan, who'd lost her natural children to a car accident. And her, her name is Madame Therese. I have a portrait of her if you'd like me to insert it later. Uh, uh, but her, my mother uh, had come to the United States to visit my uncle Guy, who uh, after graduating from uh, uh, you know, public school at 18, went to work in a uh, leather goods factory that was working with my Uncle Joe. My Uncle Joe was a multimillionaire in the leather goods uh, business. And uh, he liked being there in Germany so much that he stayed even after the war started a month later. And as he went there in like July and the, the war started on my birthday, August 1st, 1914. Uh, I wasn't born in 1914, but <laughs> 23 years later. Anyway, uh, what happened is by November, the Germans rounded up every British citizenship and put, and put them in a camp. But that camp became my, uh, my uncle's uh, uh, grad, you know, college and graduate education because there were professors there. The professors started to teach. Uh, uh, the, uh, the professors started to teach uh, postdoctorate courses, and then they realized, wait a second, there's so many people here who are uh, merchant seamen and boot blacks that were, you know, r rounded up in uh, uh, Germany. Uh, they couldn't even read or write in English, so they started a school and they started. Uh, you know, my grandmother sent uh, food and books to Guy, and we had the American Embassy was, of course, near this. It was a uh, place, Ruhleben, now part of uh, uh, Berlin, but at that time it was a suburb, a near suburb in the northwest, uh, very near where the Olympic Games were, were done in '36. I have a feeling that might have been taken down. Uh, to make way for the Olympic Games. But anyway, what happened is uh, it became a tremendous thing. There were 55 dramatic societies. My uncle was a member of uh, Irish Players. I have a, his notes on uh, the play Countess Kathleen by William uh, Butler Yeats. Uh, you know, it just was the thing. And he also, there were art exhibits in the thing, you know, people used, they had all this time in the world because, you know, they didn't have to do things, they didn't have chores. So they created an English society and even an English Trafalgar Square in the middle of the uh, thing. But the, the living conditions were very, very spartan. Uh, ten, ten people to a, a horse stall yeah. not properly insulated for the winter. Yeah. As, as, a, as a historian yourself, you realize that the 30s is the, the, the period of uh, the depression. Yeah, so, but this was before. This was 1914 so, to 1918. Yeah. He was there for, you know, 1919. He was there for five years. And, and, and when your father came here uh, yeah. in New York in the 30s, it, it was a very difficult... No, he came in seven, uh, to, to New York City. To yeah. New York City. Yeah, it was, was difficult. It, it was oh, difficult. very. But already a Greek-American community uh, was established. Uh, yeah. Do you know if uh, he had any contact with the community? Yes, uh, he had three roommates, one who was Jewish, uh, Harry Raskalenko, who wrote a book called Poet on the Scooter, and who actually wrote some mentions about my father in that book. He got the Vespa scooter from the factory and went all around the world. Uh, crazy guy. Uh, but uh, there was another guy, I think it might have been a Turk. There were four roommates, and it, they lived in Hell's Kitchen, and it was a very rough area. They, uh, they got they literally formed convoys that knows they wouldn't leave or enter Hell's Kitchen except that they were together. So they had appointed hours for leaving Hell's Kitchen to go elsewhere and appointed hours for meeting up and going back in. So four guys could handle any ruffians. And they did... Uh, and it was rough. Uh, different types of jobs they, they, yeah. they had. Yeah. My father uh, was got involved in labor unions. He was a 
the job that Lee J. Cobb had in On the Waterfront. Uh, uh, he, you know, as he was the guy that they got to speak to the labor, the, you know, the workers to get in line. Uh, he had a commanding presence, so, uh, and he could speak very well. And, uh, but uh, what happened is, you know, you, you ask about the, the poverty at the time. Well, they found out that there was an Orthodox Jew uh, was giving away food. So they went to the, the uh, temple and uh, the, the, the rabbi asked him, are you Orthodox? And they said, oh, they said, yes. <laughs> he didn't ask if they were Orthodox Jewish, <laughs> but that's a nice story. Anyway, uh, but... And this is the time he got involved uh, with politics, more in politics. Yeah, he was a Trotskyite at that time. Uh, when well, my father... Of course... He, my father was... Um, uh, uh, there were a lot of, a lot of people in that union were uh, very leftist. Uh, and uh, they led a strike in 1933 that was very successful. It only lasted two weeks. They shut down every single restaurant in, you know, in, in Light Club in New York City with the help of the literati like uh, Haywood Brune and uh, Dorothy Parker who told their, their uh, affluent friends, don't go out. The restaurants are shut down. And uh, my father led uh, a group of uh, chefs at a Waldorf Astoria who reneged on the, the deal that they had made. In other words, the deal was that everyone should be rehired, and the Waldorf felt that they didn't need to hire the troublemakers. The, you know, the people who had organized the strike within Waldorf Astoria. Uh, I later found out that one of my teachers at Harvard uh, had been a Columbia graduate student and was involved with uh, that, uh, uh, you know, movement. Uh, it was sort of funny. And, and later, when uh, a group of uh, Greeks went to fight the fascists in, the, in Spain, in the civil war in Spain. Yeah. Your father was uh, very supportive and he tried to communicate uh, messages. He, he, I, he never talked about that. He was aware of, I had, I had, of the situation. My mother had a first cousin who was a newspaper reporter yeah. who was in Spain. And now he he's, was a Canadian and now uh, James MacDonald Menifee, who was my mother's first cousin, uh, he, his family had gone to uh, my grandfather's sister. Uh, he had married a guy called Minifee, and uh, they, they went to Canada, to Saskatchewan. And my uncle uh, was a very bright guy, athletic, he got a Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, after the war, he was in the Canadian Army. He met a, an artist from America, uh, had a son and came to America and he was the, he worked with the Herald Tribune, the New York Times, and during World War II, uh, after his experience in the Spanish Civil War, he was a, uh, uh, a member of the OSS in Italy. He interviewed Conciano just before uh, uh, Conciano tried to flee in an airplane, but Mussolini heard about it and shot him down. And, uh, and when did your father became friends with Gorgi? Uh, that would be after, uh, but we haven't gotten to where uh, my father met my mother. <laughs> uh, before we go there. Oh, you want to go, go ahead in time? I, I, I want to ask you, okay, uh, because uh, you grew up, uh, or part of you growing up is a period of uh, the Cold War. And because of your father's involvement uh, in the leftist movement, uh, you you sense any kind of, of uh, discrimination or some kind of uh... oh yeah I was when I was a little boy about twelve I uh, was playing with stamps and suddenly I heard this radio uh, report about a woman that we were going to stay with a week to that day we were going to go up to Monhegan and stay with her for a week and it turns out that she committed suicide she jumped off the rocks in Monhegan. Well, what happened is, in the fall, this was in the summer, in the fall, people representing themselves as sheriffs from Maine, highly, my mother was a total ingenue when it came to, you know, thinking the worst of people. They were obviously FBI people, uh, because they, they were saying that uh, 
uh, she had left a note saying that uh, her husband wasn't giving her uh, the money on time, you know, the uh, alimony on time. But then they went to her safe deposit box in New York and found 30 grand, you know, which was a lot of money in those days when I was 12. Anyway, long story short, they concocted this idea that the communists threw her over the, the, uh, the cliff. Uh, and so they came down to my mother, who was working at the museum in uh, RISD in Providence, and uh, they kept her busy for over an hour. And I said, Mother, I said, this, and they knew about my father. That's what, uh, where I'm getting at. They asked, asked her about my father's activities. Well, my father stopped being active in politics when he met my, when, after he married my mother. He was active in uh, the union business because she gave me that as one reason for leaving him was that he would disappear uh, overnight. And uh, my father explained it, that he was playing cards to stay in, you know, in tight with the uh, other union guys. But my father hated the, uh, uh, he got to hate the union because he said, uh, uh, he didn't see that he was really uplifting them, their life, any. He said, uh, he put it very crudely, he said, uh, uh, I think they, he, they just flushed the toilet a few more times. Uh, and he was, what really discouraged him was he tried to get the European system of including the tip in the uh, bill, and they were not for it. Uh, so. How uh, a person born in Asia Minor, a Greek, uh, immigrant, working class, met an American woman, fall in love and get married. How, how, okay. how, how your what happened is met my, your okay. father? What happened is that my uncle, Guy, uh, was a sailor, and he was asked to go along with the person that my friend, uh, that my mother's friend that committed suicide, uh, uh, you know, uh, they went to Amityville. My, my uncle, by the way, even though he was in prison with the Germans, was not anti-German. He had many German friends in the Amityville area, which was a very German-dominated uh, place at that time. And this is 1928. And what happened is uh, it was a very stormy day, probably near Gale, 40 to 45 miles an hour, probably. And it was a very tall sailboat, racing-style boat and they foolishly uh, wouldn't say no. So my uncle said, I'm the most experienced person, I'll take the place of this guy who knows very little about sailing. And when they went through the Fire Island Inlet, where Robert Moses Park is on one side, and uh, uh, the winds were coming from every which way. Uh, the waves, uh, I've been told that at 30 miles an hour from personal observance, the waves are 10 feet tall. So I would imagine the waves that knocked over this boat were probably 12 to 15 feet tall. Anyway, uh, that's, that's what caused my mother to come to America because the girlfriend ordered the most expensive Campbell and Son funeral in New York City, okay? And my, uncle, my grandfather pretty well spent his money. Uh, my mother referred to him as an alcoholic uh, my cousin's wife, who was an enabler of an alcoholic, uh, said, oh, no, he just liked to enjoy himself. Uh, anyway, uh, my grandfather did, didn't have the money to pay for the funeral, so my mother felt obligated to come and pay it in, over time. She took his job. At, she was 25 at the time. She had been, uh, since her early 20s, uh, many times, uh, spent many summers, uh, she had learned about art uh, from a Chinese art dealer uh, who's uh, Eurasian, uh, A.W. Barr. Uh, this guy uh, sold jades and uh, Yellow River Scrolls to the Whitney Whitney's and the Vanderbilts, which are now, you can see, in the Metropolitan Museum. But uh, when I got married, he gave us a nice little print <laughs> of a bird, uh, you know, about a 19th century, you know, uh, Chinese uh, watercolor. Uh, but she learned a lot from him, and uh, so when she took over my uncle's job, uh, within four years, at age 29 in 1932, 
she was made co-editor of Art News. She interviewed, uh, 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 <laughs> the funny story is she interviewed uh, uh, Gertrude Stein and Alice Talkless. My mother was very ethical, but I guess as a news reporter, she, was, she dropped some of her ethics and she bribed somebody to find out where, she, where they, the two had come when they came back from, you know, uh, you know uh, France. They, they probably sensed that Hitler was going to take over and they, they were the first to leave. And uh, she found out the uh, apartment number, got in the elevator, knocked on the door, and Alice B. Tuckless came to the door and says, Gertrude Stein doesn't do interviews in New York. But eventually, my mother got the interview. Uh, a very, a very prestigious uh, magazine. Yeah, uh, yeah. It was the major art news magazine at that yes. time. Uh, and for how long did she work there? She was a uh, not critic, right? She was a critic from 1925 to 20, uh, 28 to 32, and uh, I think she was she had a, a a false pregnancy when she was 35. In, I mean, in 1935, when she, you know, and I think she resigned from that job, and that was when uh, she'd already met my father, because my father was a friend of this wonderful ballet dancer, uh, Maria Therese, Stefan, Bo Mrs. Bourgeois, uh, and uh, he, they had a. Uh, a pension, or not a pension, a soiree in Brooklyn Heights, where all the famous people, literary people, came. So my mother was invited by her her uh, critic, uh, Stephen Bourgeois. Uh, he knew my uncle because I found uh, a first edition of some French book about you know anyway it had some beautiful woodcuts in it, uh, where Stephen Bourgeois gave back the uh, book to my uncle. Uh, but his wife uh, knew my father. She was Greek. And I found out recently that she taught all the Greek ladies not only ballet, but all the Horiatic dances, you know. And, uh, and I think she was probably a left-leaning person herself. Uh, but uh, in, in any case, at, at that meeting, my father looked at her with his deep brown eyes the whole evening, and shortly after that he said, let's get married now or never. They were married within a month. And uh, uh, That's a great story. But uh, So I came around in 37. My mother was pregnant with me, obviously, uh, you know, late December or late November, uh, and she said to my father, you can't bring a child into this world in New York City. I was born in New York City, but my father had located an apartment in uh, Croton, or Harmon, it's called. It was overlooking the railroad yards of the uh, New York Central. Croton is a major express stop on the, the uh, things, and it's the terminal stop of the uh, Metro North now. Anyway, uh, this woman was a playwright a very famous playwright, uh, Margaret uh, Mayo, and she uh, had written a play called Twin Beds that supposedly, according to my father, uh, you know, basically created the fad for Twin Beds. Uh, and she also uh, was, I found out recently that she was challenged to write a play within a day, and she did it in 23 hours. Uh, and r more recently I found out what my father didn't know. He did know that she went to Hollywood and was the mistress of Louis B. Mayer, uh, but uh, she was one of the four founders of the Goldwyn Company. She had married as an actress and as a, a, a playwright, she had married another person uh, who was a director, Arthur Selwyn. And he happened to have a half-brother named Samuel Goldfuss. Goldfuss, Selwyn, Samuel Goldwyn. So she was, she was the great aunt of Tony Goldwyn, the actor today. <laughs> but uh, 
She, and, and where you grew up? I, I, I say for the first year, I grew up in Croton. I was blonde, curly hair, and there was a dog. I think she had a dog in the background. My son has them. My oldest son has the pictures, and he's supposed to do them. Uh, but at age one, my mother decided, she, my mother would get all through my, my early life, she would get these small remittances from rich relatives. And it was enough to go to Europe on a boat. So at a year old, we debarked at Southampton. I was wet. My mother was in a summer dress, and it was freezing cold. You know, because, you know, the water and the wind. And my father said, oh, I'll give the guy a, a guinea, and he'll let us right through the head of the line. And my mother said, oh, no. My mother was very, English people can't be corrupted. And my father said, yeah, they can. <laughs> we went in. But uh, we were there, and the minute they, uh, uh, the relatives found out that my father was a good talker, they wanted me, him to meet Uncle Joe, because Uncle Joe was planning to leave all his millions to the Salvation Army. I don't give to the Salvation Army. My family is given plenty. <laughs> uh, but what happened is Uncle Joe uh, was a, a member of Parliament. Uh, he was the Lord Mayor. He was a mayor of Walsall. And when he died, and which I found out recently, in, I ordered a little profile book of him about the size of a Time magazine uh, of his life, that he died not, you know, at the end of the month of August uh, when I was there in 38. Uh, and it took his wife four years to get the town of Walsall to agree to his 14-bell carillon that he gave them. And that was the guy who was extremely wealthy. He had uh, leather goods going all around the world. He and my uh, grandfather had made a killing on horses in the in military in the Boer War. But, you know, bits and spurs, you know, but you know, my uncle made all kinds of leather goods and he was all over. And that's why my uncle Guy went to uh, uh, Germany to a leather factory uh, rather than work for his father in a bits and spurs thing. It was very dull. I anyway, see. long story short, uh, uh, we ended up in Greece and we lived in Greece in Ipsico. Uh, uh, I just found out that one of my father's relatives, Manuel Caldas, who's a big uh, I think he's the Caldus. If you look under the name Caldus, he's the one that is, he comes up the most because he's a brilliant uh, uh, physicist. Uh, and he found an apartment in a very swanky neighborhood of Psycho, literally across the street from Prince Paul, who was later to become King Paul. Uh, and we stayed there. Uh, and I think, you know, had my parents stayed there in Greece, the, the marriage might have had a better chance of lasting longer. Because, uh, as my mother explained, the reason for leaving when we got back uh, was that uh, uh, it was hard to live off the seat of my father's pants, but impossible if you had three people living off the seat of his pants. My father didn't have regular jobs. Uh, so, he, uh, at what age you came back to the States? I was uh, three years old. Uh, no. Yes, three years old, 1940. Uh, we came back early in 1940, before Ohi Day. We didn't wait that long. <laughs> we, it was right after the Italians were beaten yeah. in the Balkans. Yeah. That's when uh, there was a threat to uh, draft my father in the Greek army, even though he was, had a Turkish passport. And it was, he went to Greece and England under a Turkish passport with me in the picture. I've seen this picture in various catalogs of your father's. Uh, yeah. Tell us a few things about uh, this picture. Okay, this was me at about age uh, four in 1941 in a studio that he had, and uh, he put this in uh, several catalogs. Uh, it was done by a good friend of ours, Francis Avery, who uh, uh, was a member of the, uh, she was like the oldest member a female member of the National Arts Club when she died in 97 or 98. Just a terrific woman. Uh, she would go to museums and she, she would bring a movie camera and she'd just go <laughs> and then she would slow it down to, you know, slow down when she was pro 
projecting it for viewers so you could see what what was going on. But uh, now uh, I was very close to my father, even though at age three we came back to a, a Lower East Side, and in the uh, the winter of 1940. Uh, we shuffled off to Buffalo. My mother and I left my father behind. And that's when he uh, had his first exhibition and when he sold a painting to Dr. Barnes. At that age, you remember your father painting? Yes, uh, and what, one of the things that uh, happened is him, he would come up and visit me in Buffalo and we would do tempera paintings on uh, poster boards, backs of posters, back, you know, uh, and unfortunately, he was really angry at my mother when she moved to Providence from Buffalo. She left those behind. Oh. And this is uh, here in New York? Yeah, this was uh, at about five years old, uh, 42, uh, in New York City in Washington Square Park, or, you know, not Washington Square North, looking at Washington Square Park. I still can remember a certain fragrance from one of the bushes in Washington Square Park, because I associate that with the uh, the uh, ice cream man that was nearby. <laughs> anyway, um, I would visit my father four times a year uh, for a week at a time, and at that time I would meet all my father's friends. You know, uh, uh, he was very close with Franz Klein. Uh, you know, uh, he even encouraged Klein to use color, which made his dealer. Uh, Sidney Janis ups really upset because he had a niche as a uh, you know painter of black lines with paint you know the painter's brush not a I mean a house painter's brush as opposed to you know a, a, an artist's brush and uh, the funny thing about Klein was he was a very sweet man and he loved my dad because he did a group of pen and ink uh, uh, sketches of my father on cedar bar menus that my father treasured. And uh, he was a just, he was just a very sweet guy, uh, but he was colorblind, which explains why he did the black. But he had a Jaguar and he would drive my father. And my father would be like this, he, you know, he would tell him, you know, that's a red light. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but, you know, my father knew a lot of different artists. Uh, uh, de Kooning was his closest friend. Uh, my father, for example, after I left, uh, my father did a series of lectures called The Key to Modern Art, and they were held in uh, recital rooms that he uh, rented from uh, Carnegie Hall. I don't know if you're aware that the Carnegie Hall, there are back offices and there are many small recital rooms. So uh, this is how uh, and Bill de Kooning ran the slide projector. This, this is how also we can explain that although Aristotelus never had a formal education in fine right. arts, he knew. Well, oh, what I forgot to mention is I, we forgot to mention is after my mother had this uh, hysterical pregnancy before I was born, they were working on the WPA, and that's where my father met Diego Rivera, and he was kibitzing Diego Rivera about a painting that he was doing. And my Diego turned to him and he said, hey, Caldas, you're the artist. Here's the brushes, here's the painting, uh, here's the paints, here's the canvas. And that's where. And the painting in the other room, the still life, was my father's first painting. That was 1939. Your mother was um, an art critic. Yeah. Uh, how, uh, what she was thinking about uh, Aristodemus as a painter? Okay. My mother was super ethical. Uh, when she was working at the Buff Albright Art Gallery, Albright Art Knox Gallery uh, in Buffalo, they wanted the director wanted to buy a painting, and my mother said that would look very suspicious. You know, she, you know con conflict of interest. You know, she was extreme about that. Unlike uh, we have a Supreme Court justice whose wife makes billion, millions of dollars uh, of raising money from rich donors to fight c conservative courses. But my mother was very, very ethical, uh, and it's one of the reasons. But as far as concerned the aesthetics, 
to but she did not write about art, uh, about my father's art. I can tell you that. But she knew the oh, value. Oh, she knew about the it. Value. This is what I'm trying to She find knew out. the value. Uh, she certainly was impressed. The artistic value, she was, not yes. the monetary value. Yeah, but she was impressed by, you know, the fact that Barnes bought it. But, uh, you know, I, I think she had a, a rather larger view. Uh, she put together a book about my uncle's writings after he was died. And, uh, you know, her aesthetic was, was different. Uh, she included a a a, 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 a painting uh, of a cow that a professor from uh, University of Rhode Island had done, and my father said, "Oh, what was that all about?" You know, that you know. But uh, my father used to take my uncle's book, and he had a copy of it, and he would take it and get xeroxes of it, and he would give out one section, he said, because there's never been any work on Surah. And he told me the reason why there's no work written about Surah is there were very few paintings. So there was nobody who could be given a painting to write a review. Uh, so uh, this essay that's in Reaching for Art by Guy Eglinton uh, is about the Fauves and about the thing, and that was my, my father went around with it in his hand and would give it to artists that he felt were worthy. Uh, and also your father was a very prolific uh, speaker. Yeah. He gave uh, many lectures, right. legendary le yeah. lectures. And uh, I just sent away, uh, I have, a, I just, I'm sending away, a, a, using Legacy Box, I sent away a reel-to-reel -reel tape of a lecture at the Artist Club. Uh, my father was such a frequent speaker of the Artist Club. One time, we were supposed to go to a meeting at Green Street when I was visiting, and we arrived and the hall was empty. They had moved the venue because they were tired of my father hogging the, the, uh, the, the floor. What my father would do at a meeting is he would size up what everybody else said, and then he would distill out of that the best. And my father was always using dialectic, you know, uh, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. synthesis. And he felt that was the way you did paintings. That was his aesthetic. And he used, uh, the other term he used was uh, uh, the liquids and the solids. You know, liquids and the solids, the, you know, as in thesis and antithesis. Uh, and uh, you know, coming up with a uh, synthesis of that, but in, he, in the hardcore oil, right? No, oh, always mix. oil, always oil. Except he spent a lot of time in 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 uh, in the hospital, not in doctor's office. That's why he spent a lot of time in hospitals, and he did a lot of uh, works on paper with uh, magic uh, magic markers uh, eventually, and before that uh, uh, with crepa. A lot of crepas. I have a lot of crepa uh, drawings of my father, and they were basically of some of the the uh, the, uh, the pictures that you see around. Uh, I would like us to give us some uh, insight. This uh, long, a very strong friendship with de Kooning and yeah. also uh, his sister. Okay. Yeah. My my. I, I also, and my father spoke about de Kooning in a, a lecture that he I have recorded, and that's going to be available. Uh, I also interviewed de Kooning myself for three hours. I have that tape being uh, digitized. I'll put it in the cloud for you to access. Uh, but uh, de Kooning was so friendly to my father that when he got the gold medal from the Queen of uh, 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 Netherlands, uh, he visited my father at his uh, apartment in the uh, Beacon Hotel on 74th Street and uh, Broadway. And uh, he was just a, uh, a very close friend. Uh, he'd given my father uh, the money, he said to his dealer uh, for Cod, he says, give Caldas the money from these pictures. And when I tried to keep the pictures, for Cod threatened to sue me. So I didn't, I, you know, I, I didn't have anything in paper that, you know, about it, but I did get the money, but it was rather it was, it was a sketchy kind of thing. He sold it to another art dealer, Pace Gallery, uh, and uh, over two years he got the money. And I got the money over two years. 
but uh, I, uh, I had to pay income tax because that put me over the income tax limit at the time. Uh, that was a big mistake. Uh, but uh, nowadays, you don't have to worry about it. Only the billionaires have to pay income tax. <laughs> and they figure out ways around it. And then the Cooney sister, she saw something in your father and started painting him. Yeah. Uh, he became very friendly with Elaine, especially when, you know, Elaine was estranged from uh, Bill. You know, Bill had a child by a bar barmaid uh, named Lisa. And uh, my father, uh, when Jason, my eldest, was a year old, we drove out in a VW van that we'd equipped to be able to sleep in. And uh, Bill was in a barn that was a studio before he built the, the elegant studio he has now, or is still there, hopefully. Uh, what happened is Lisa was in the far background. He was very nice to me. I remember him on 8th Street when he had a studio on 8th Street, and he was always good to me, always smiling. He had a great sense of humor. So when he gave me, when I interviewed him and I said that my father said, even the scribble on a napkin would be worth something by de Kooning, when I left with Elaine that night, it was the night of uh, Reagan Mondale debate, the, the last one in November. Uh, he came out of the kitchen with this rolled up paper with thumbtack holes in it. And it was a squiggle. It might have been the inspiration for his clam digger sculptures, but it was just a, it was a, it was a gracious scribble. Uh, I recently sold it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, uh, Bill was the only painting, we gave him a painting because he'd given my, my father a painting, the only painting in his living room, unless they've changed things, uh, was a, a painting by my father. And I have it on videotape of him pointing to a figure in the middle of the mountain. It's one of those uh, uh, cycladic landscapes with the mountain and the sea. And he said, that's Caldas's spirit. Very so they, that, they were very close. Uh, uh, they were close to my mother, too. Guess who uh, gave affidavits for my mother to divorce him in 1944? Elaine and Bill de Cooney. Both made up stories that my father had cheated on her. Whether it was true or not, I doubt. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when my father was in the hospital, it, joint diseases, he, when he was in his 70s, he would send me down the hall and said, look at that person. And it was somebody who reminded him of, his, of my mother. And once I got my parents together in Provincetown, and I went to the movies, and I came back, and there they were naked. <laughs> they were very embarrassed, <laughs> as much as I was embarrassed. Uh, and there was another time where we tried to, where they were together, and. I actually ran away because my father was doing everything to help this patient and friend of my mother. My mother by that time had quit the art business. When her boss from Buffalo and Providence was fired from the museum in, uh, 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 in uh, Providence, I, she gave up on the art world and she went back to school and got a, a degree in social work and that's what she did until her death. And she was very good because I got a lot of, when we had a memorial service for her, a lot of her patients came and said that, yeah, she had saved their marriage. And I kidded my mother. I said, uh, you do a lot of marriage counseling. She said, how, how are you, uh, you weren't good at your marriage, <laughs> you, know, you know. But, you know, I learned later, dealing with my father as an adult, that he was impossible to live with. Uh, you know, my mother never said that. My, the worst thing that my, my father ever said about my mother was that she was a sleeping Jesus, which is a double-edged, you know, sword. Uh, cuts both positive and negative. Uh, my mother had very little energy. She had polio as a child. Uh, when she would work, she would spend most of the weekend sleeping, and I would go to movies. During the week, I was shipped out uh, of the age of seven when Providence to a school that was very good, uh, and I boarded by the week. And I'd come home on Friday, and I would go to movies on Saturday, 
morning, Saturday evening. <laughs> one time I saw a movie three times in one weekend. Uh, but I always had dinners, lunch, you know, meals with my mother. Those were good times. But she was, very, she was a very frail woman, and she died at age uh, 64. Well, young. Yeah. But your father, he had a, uh, a sense that he was Greek, he was American, or you, you had a sense of being a descendant of, of a Greek. You, you had yeah, a... well, it was, it was confusing. When I went away to a very Anglo, Anglo-sized prep school, uh, you know, I felt like, you know, I might have been the black there. You know, there weren't any blacks at that time there. Uh, now it's 59 different countries. So, you know, they even have a director of, uh, of you know, synthesis. Not that, that's not the word they call it, but, you know, director of inclusion. Uh, but at the time I went, I, I, I always felt like, I remember coming there the first day and I'd say, these tall, blonde, blue-eyed boys. You know, that was most of them. But unlike Andover and Exeter, uh, St. Paul's, and, uh, they, they had Jews. For example, the famous DA, Morgenthau, went to Deerfield during World War II. He was there during the whole time. And then the boys had to plant potatoes. That was their physical activity. There were no sports then. Uh, and, uh, you know, they grew vegetables and potatoes. Community. Yeah. Uh, the headmaster was, had come there in 1904 on his way to law school from uh, Amherst College, and he fell in love with a, a young woman in the town whose father had a thing, and the two of them became uh, headmaster and headmistress. I had her as a teacher, Helen Boyden, but he was a, a tremendous influence in my life. Uh, he had the same ethical standards as my mother, very strict. Uh, he taught, he said, you boys are very privileged. He says, you've got to learn to give back. Uh, the late David Koch became a lifetime uh, trustee of Deerfield because he gave so much money to Deerfield. And uh, unlike his brother Charles, he gave a lot of money in New York City, both the American Ballet Theater and, of course, the David Koch Auditorium. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, he died of pancreatic cancer at a fairly young age. Uh, he was four or five years behind me in, in, in school. But he was there my PG year. But my mother was uh, a big influence in my life. Uh, uh, it was interesting when she came and she liked uh, one of my friend's uh, watercolors. He gave it to her because he knew that she was had been an art critic. For an art critic to say that it was good, his father later, his father was an economic professor at Harvard. He was from Australia, so Dick Smithies had a, uh, a funny uh, accent. And uh, after I left Harvard, uh, the father Smithies became the uh, head of the Kirkland House that I was the, uh, lived in. But uh, Dick was a big uh, alternate on the New York uh, musical scene. He married a gal who was in musicals while at Harvard. So uh, that's why I wanted to see if your father had a sense of Greekness. Or oh, you, yeah, I'll, I'll or, tell you about that. Or, you ha or also you, because you have the name also. Yeah, well. And, 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 and if he traveled to Greece uh, after Yeah, uh, after I've been many war, times. And how they received his work in Greece. Okay, uh, there's a problem there, which we'll yeah, talk about. Yeah, I know. You know about the problem? <laughs> that that uh, uh, the copyrights and the, the, those things, right? No, there's a, a problem that... Okay, where do you want me to begin? No, no, no. No, the, the sense of, of, of Greekness. Oh, my father... Okay, he took me to all the churches in New York and even to the Jewish church. That was his name for Temple Emmanuel. Uh, I went to St. Bartholomew's the very elegant St. whatever it was, the Lutheran church that was on uh, uh, Park Avenue and uh, St. Patrick's. And uh, he even took me on one Easter Eve to the uh, cathedral that Penelope goes to, uh, you know, where Stephanopoulos is the, uh, uh, the uh, pastor or whatever, your rector or uh, all these names. Anyway, uh, 
he uh, had a lot of friends at the Greek National Herald. Uh, he taught me uh, the meanings of words, for example, like sarcasm. Sarcasm means twisted flesh. So, you know, if I'm smiling like this, and I, you know, that's a sarcastic smile. Uh, he even pointed out that, you know, uterus comes from the word hist, 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 oh, what a historus, and of course, histor hysterical. You know, that's something that women are hysterical. Uh, so my mother had a hysterical pregnancy. It's a false pregnancy, you know. But uh, I'm wondering now even if she had maybe a miscarriage, you know, because my daughter had two miscarriages before each of her uh, children. And then a surprise one many years later. <laughs> so those uh, the Greek words that your father... Oh, yeah, you, it's all, constantly telling also me... Also gave you a sense of Greekness too? Yeah. You oh yeah, feeling, he gave me uh, he gave me a, an army language book uh, with records, and the first phrase I learned was "Thelo mi abira, thelo mi akrasi." <laughs> that was the first words in this army, New U.S. Army uh, book. A beer and wine, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but "krasi," I mean, "bira" came before "krasi." Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, I did try to learn a little bit, but it wasn't a great uh, teaching device. I did learn the Greek alphabet. He gave me a, a kiddie's book on the Greek alphabet. I did learn that. Uh, I could say my name in Greek, Kalthis. He gave you a boat also, right? What? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> my father was good at, you know, these lectures on art, and I was teaching about the, uh, the, uh, the uh, growth of the menu. It was ancient history, you know, European history, and I was teaching about the development of Greece, and my father gave a lecture to me twice, we went together, he picked out the slides at the Metropolitan, what you could rent at the time. Regular slides, not like lantern slides that he used when he was lecturing at Carnegie Hall. Uh, and he gave that lecture to me twice. It basically went from uh, you know, Phoenician times to Egyptian to Minoan to Argos, you know. And I gave that lecture without notes at my first job in Farmingdale. Uh, and my college professor turned chairman was in the audience with his class as well. Uh, and I got good reviews. <laughs> but uh, I, I learned from my father how to speak and one time it really frightened me. And I see now how speaking, if you have that gift, it can be a very uh, easily corrupted. Uh, I was afraid of it. Uh, I was at a school board meeting and I listened like my father and I took some of the points that were being said and I refuted some of the negative points and came out with a synthesis at the end and I got a rave, you know, practically standing applause. Uh, and I, that was scary. That kind of feedback was scary. Uh, even though I'd been teaching for a time at that point. Uh, you, you, you are a historian, right? Yeah, I studied history and lit, modern period of uh, France, Germany, and uh, uh, Russia. And I, fortunately, I was very fortunate to have, I started out in biochemistry, so I had, you know, chemistry and uh, biology. Uh, in my sophomore year, I had organic chemistry, and I made a, I was, told by the professor's wife who's conducting the labs that I was to go and purify cholesterol. They didn't even explain what cholesterol was at that point. Uh, this is 1956, fall of 56, and I came up with a heavier product. And I said, I can't do this. If I wanted to become a biochemist, I'm not gonna be able to do the research. I'm just not precise enough. And the other thing I didn't like was that the other people in the laboratory were like this. They were almost as if they had horse blinders on, you know, headed toward medical school. Uh, so I didn't like it. And, I, what, and, and I, I got a lot of advantages. I got private instruction in German literature. 
because I was late coming into the History and Lit program in the middle of my sophomore year. Then the next year I had the son of a famous uh, uh, world history book uh, author that was used in schools. Uh, very great uh, mind uh, teaching me uh, Russian intellectual history. And uh, when I started teaching, the uh, superintendent had realized that I had uh, studied about Russia and he advertised in both the, the Daily News and the New York Times that I was going to give uh, Russian history at this school. And this was 1960 was the first year you could use the word socialism in the classroom. Up until that time, it had been banned for New York teachers to even use the word. Uh, but it didn't get enough people to fly. Then I had the idea, hey, I can teach history through movies. And I, I found a place to get the Russian movies. And it wasn't a matter of the money. It was just that only three or four people signed up. So the whole thing was dropped. So I, but, Eisenstein... But I, I spent most of my career... What kind of movies you played? Oh, it would have been... Uh, Potemkin and, uh, yeah, you know, all, 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 I would have started class, with that. The classics. Yeah, I would have started with Potemkin. But, uh, yeah, I had a, a professor who was a civil servant in Russian history at the time of the revolution. He heard sh shots in the street. He was such a timid guy. He went back into his apartment and came out four days later and he said, the revolution was over. <laughs> and I saw his last... Uh, Lecture, he, he retired that year. Everybody from the history department was there. Schlesinger Jr. was there. I took his course in American intellectual history. But I never took American history as such in college. But I had a great uh, teacher and, and in- you uh, went to Harvard? Yeah. How expensive was Harvard? $800 tuition. And guess what? I had to pay, I had applied for a scholarship and uh, room and board, I lived in a house that was built in 1600, uh, 1660, and it was $60 a semester uh, for the room, and I think it was $150 a semester for food, okay? So my total expenses were $1,100 plus books. I figured out my expenses at Harvard while I was there, five years, averaged about $2,500. That means my expenses, not just during the school year, but during the summer too. You know, so I had to have $2,500. My mother, I, I, I was convinced I, I had skipped a grade in uh, um, elementary school and the headmaster told my mother he didn't think I was emotionally mature enough to go to Harvard. He had said that to another boy who came from a toy family, you know, Mark's toy family. He'd gone to Harvard despite what the, you know, the, uh, the headmaster had said. But my mother, you know, revered authorities, and she believed that he was right uh, to uh, do that. And uh, so I stayed another year at Deerfield. And uh, I, started, I, I was one of the stars in Clarence Day's uh, Life with Father. I played mother. And the, the, the guy, we both went to Harvard <laughs> the next year. Uh, the father and the mother. And the father was uh, very, he had a lifetime job. He was the, uh, the financial advisor to Mrs. Astor and until she died. And he was like the last person to live, leave uh, one of the five towns. And after that, they could put the uh, cloth over the street to make it safe for Orthodox Jews to walk. Anyway. So your father was very proud of you going to oh, Harvard yeah, yeah, and supporting yeah. your, he, your my education. My father criticized me uh, 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 again and again. Uh, he compared me to my uncle Christos, who was a very elegant man, very bright. Uh, he'd studied agronomy in Italy. Uh, when I first met my uncle, I had to speak to him in a combination of Italian phrases that I knew from Latin and uh, uh, French, because all upper class you know, uh, Greeks knew French at the time. And, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, he would call me a Babbitt. And, or he'd call, oh, you're just like the Babbitt, my uncle. You know, my uncle was the head of tobacco in Greece. 
He negotiated deals with all the foreign companies for Greek tobacco. Uh, and during the colonel's time, he lost his super pension. Guess why? He was the head of the resistance in the eastern Aegean during World War II. Uh, but uh, Christos was a very, very good man. And uh, I told my family, I said, you know, when I met Christos finally in 72, I realized that my father was really complimenting me, even though he thought I was, he was, he was you know, he wanted me to be more like him. So, you know, not, you know, more free-spirited, less uptight, you know, less bourgeois. Uh, the word Babbitt, you know, was the word from the, uh, the novel. Uh, he used that a lot, overused it. Uh, but uh, when I interviewed other people, uh, for example, at, at lunch one time, there was a Greek parent in Sleepy Hollow. Uh, during back, it was like a parent's luncheon for the teachers. And I said, uh, oh, he said, oh, I met your father. He said, uh, your father married a princess. He said, and you were, you were, you, you were like the head of your class at Harvard. You know, you would, ex you know, exaggerate everything. My mother's family and my cousin's family Eglinton's were on a chart, a genealogy chart called a Bar Sinister from the uh, Earl of Eglinton's family. Uh, the Earl of Eglinton today's name is Montgomery with a French spelling. Okay? It's the Montgomery clan. But it was called the Earl of Eglinton. Eglinton, uh, the Eglinton Castle, which is now in ruins, was the last in 1935 was the last tournament to be held. And guess who was there? Queen Victoria was in attendance at this tournament, the last medieval tournament. But uh, so there was this sketchy relationship of a man who came from Scotland to the Midlands with money, but no known family. And his sister went to Canada after she married you know, another Scot. Uh, in, in the 50s, along with uh, Aristotimo, there were some other Greek-American uh, painters, like, let's say, Hios or, or Daphnis. Your yeah, he was a good friend of Di 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 Daphnis and Hios. He hated the other guy, the guy that became more famous because a uh, Greek uh, uh, gallery owner uh, did it, the guy that was the... Uh, the um, you mean Stamos? Stamos, yeah. In 1973, I was 36 years old, and I was embarrassed by my father acting like a child. He was chasing Stamos all over the exhibit of the uh, USA, uh, calling him a fag, faggot, a homosexual. My father was, uh, it, it actually, I would say it did a lot to impair his saleability, because he also made fun of Meyer Shapiro, who was the a uh, professor of art history at uh, uh, Columbia who trained most of the critics in New York. And the only critic who liked my father was Hilton Kramer. And later, Hilton Kramer, when I asked him, can I use your name? And I guess he knew that, uh, you know, he said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. Because Hilton Kramer, in a case where a building had uh, gotten garbage art, wanted to remove it because it started to smell. The, uh, the artists for this garbage art won the case. And Hilton Kramer was called in by the management as a thing that, you know, this was not art. And uh, the judge in his decision uh, said, Hilton Kramer only likes dead artists. So, you know, he was, you know, the problem was at the time that uh, uh, he was with Mrs. Cornbley. She was a, a fledgling uh, art dealer, came in from a wealthy family in the theater and, uh, m you know, large buildings. You know, she had mortgages up the kazoo. Uh, my father never had to worry about making money on the, the sales because uh, she would keep it and give him an 8% interest. It was That's what she was getting in mortgages at the time. And uh, she would only give him the money when she sold a mortgage. You know, when the, the accountants told her to sell a mortgage. 
And one time I sent her check in. To, my father got a, they used me as my address, as his address, in the suburbs, so you didn't have to pay that New York sales tax. Uh, he, uh, uh, the check bounced because she hadn't put the money in to cover it uh, yet. You know, she would tell my father when to cash the check. But uh, no, my father, uh, he, he was, good, he was a good friend of Hios and more than Lukakis. He was very, very fond of Lukakis. Lukakis was a brilliant, brilliant uh, sculptor. Uh, and uh, his, was uh, Lucas Amara? And also George Constant oh, was a very good friend. Uh, you know, I've had lots of discussions with Georgette. I think Georgette's done a better job of getting her father's work out there, although he did a lot of work on paper, so it's easier to get works on paper into museums and galleries. But, uh, uh, no, it's, you know, my father also knew, uh, was a very big friend of uh, uh, Sally Avery, and Sally Avery was, was told to me to be my advisor when he died, and I went to her and she says three things. One, you keep it out in front of the public eye. Two, you buy it back if it's below what value you think it is, should be. And three, get a scribe. And the latter I did not get. And that's probably a good reason why. Uh, I'll give you an example. De Kooning became famous when Elaine was sleeping with Thomas Hess. Thomas Hess wrote the first book on de Kooning. Uh, de Kooning actually, uh, you know, discussed art with my father a lot. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, another person that he knew uh, was Mercedes Matter, but I never realized she was an artist because I knew she was married to a famous photographer, uh, Herbert Mather, who was uh, uh, associate professor at uh, Yale. He commuted to New Haven a couple of times a week, and I knew his son, who was about my age, Alexander. And not until I was with the dealer, Borgie, and he bought all of Alexander's mother's paintings did I realize this woman was an outstanding painter, and I only knew her as a sexy mother. <laughs> and, you know, the rumors were that she slept with many, many people, and a lot of the paintings that she had went to, you know, boyfriends. But... Uh, the, my first introduction to her was I walked into the, her apartment on uh, McDougal Alley, which was right up against a skyscraper on Fifth Avenue, and there was a grand piano, and on the right was a Pollock, and then beyond the grand piano was a picture of Mercedes with Topless in front of the same picture. I knew Mercedes' aunt, and my father, this was another artist that my father knew, she would put me up on Beekman Place. Her name was Sarah Carls Johns. She was the younger sister of Arthur Carls, who was in the, uh, the original Armory show. Uh, Arthur Carls had married a Mexican woman who was named Mercedes, but uh, uh, Mercedes had a very, uh, was given at birth a very you know, Anglo name like Janine or something that she didn't want, but when her mother was banished by her rich father, she took up the name Mercedes. And I saw her last at uh, the memorial service for uh, Bill de Kooning. She still was strikingly beautiful. Uh, uh, very elegant woman and very talented. It is clear that uh, your father's work, Aristodemus uh, Caldi's work, was very well received uh, from the American audience. Let's say, yeah, uh, and especially by artists, by artists, yeah, American art. and also uh, it was uh, well received from the early days, even uh, in museums, uh, in, in 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 art galleries. How was the Greek American community received if he, if they knew by your father, or how your father well, he was did, received in Greece? Well, okay, the problem in Greece was that he had a close friend, uh, Costas Simarakis. I don't know if you were aware of him, but. When my father died, Costa started painting things that looked like my father. If you go to the Bayside Diner, on either side of the Bayside Diner are Caldas landscapes painted by Costa Simarakis. Annie Simarakis, Costa's only wife, 
did a panegyric, uh, an interview in Gynekon in Greek, so I don't know what it said, but, uh, uh, you know, she was very, that's how, I guess, you know, he had seen this article and he became basically like my father's sidekick. And my father convinced him to leave his brother, who had the, uh, who, who was a commercial uh, ad agency, uh, George Zimarakis, and uh, uh, become a painter full time. But occasionally he would do commercial things just to make life. Unfortunately, he died of pancreatic cancer, refusing to get treated. I've had pancreatic cancer. I was treated, and I'm still healthy. Uh, but it's now. Uh, four years later, uh, but uh, you know, I think there was a guy with a single name who was hovering around uh, Costas, and I think he somehow got a hold of some of these paintings that he did, and he was selling them in Greece as Caldas's. Uh, Kuros had Angelos Camilos of Kuros had me do this elaborate, uh, you know. Uh, uh, essay saying I was the only son of uh, Aristotle Miscaldus and these are ethnic and he had me stamp my father's signature and my signature on the back of the canvases uh, but he couldn't get uh, sales in, in uh, Greek galleries for that reason. People, people were suspect. In other words, the, the, uh, the market had been polluted by paintings that were not by my father in his style, so that's un misfortune. He he was uh, reading uh, uh, Greek newspapers or listening to Greek music. Yeah. yeah, well, he only listened to Greek music after his leg was amputated. Uh, in, in other words, before that, his attitude when we'd visit a friend, for example, John Groth's uh, former uh, lover, uh, had married a Greek man, and they lived in. A, you know, one of those small apartments, but in a very elegant neighborhood on Ball Park Avenue. And they had WQXR playing in the background. And, you know, once my father even said to me the same thing, he said, he said, well, these people can't, don't have any thoughts. They have to have music in the background. One time I had music in the car when I was driving him. He says, don't you have, have, ever, ever have time for thoughts? And irony is sometimes when I get back from exercise and I'm parking the car, I just sit there for a few minutes looking at the skyline uh, and the clouds and just relaxing. But that's my best place to meditate because there's no distractions. You know, sitting in the driver's seat of a car, if you're not driving, there's no distractions. Uh, but uh, now my father was, uh, he had a lot of, a lot of uh, pupils. Uh, men stretched his canvases. Gesserit's canvases. Uh, women actually did housekeeping for him. Uh, one woman who was very fond of my father, Janet Bossy, uh, bought him, you know, a nice suit. So he had pinstripe suit. She bought him a TV. And only in the last four, five years of his life did he listen to Greek uh, music on the radio and watched and have TV, have the sound in back. Uh, Unfortunately, I couldn't get him to go to Burke, which my mother had gone to one time when she uh, had, you know, uh, the need to have a rehab. And uh, uh, he refused to go there. He said, nobody will come and visit me. You know, he wanted to be in a rehab, you know, at the regular hospital. Uh, unfortunately, they did, at Burke, what they did is they get you out of bed at 8 o'clock in the morning or 7.30, and you get dressed, and then you eat. You know, my father would sit around after he had his uh, leg removed in his wheelchair until noon before he did anything. But as a child, we would go one block, it would take 45 minutes. He would talk to everyone. Very Another, social. Yeah, very social. Uh, by the way, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Dr. Ruth, and I've heard her say on two occasions that one of the ways you stay young is to talk to strangers. And, you know, be involved, you know, don't, don't be just into yourself. Uh, and I do that. Sometimes it annoys the people I'm with. <laughs> How about the guy? How about you? Uh, you, you, 
you play Greek music, you enjoy Greek food. Well, you, I don't play Greek. Greece? I don't play Greek music, but uh, uh, I remember my father had this one song that he'd play again and again on a record. Uh, it would end a, a popsy or something. Something was a popsy, uh, and he would explain Today, that. Yeah, popsy, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he would explain that most of these songs were uh, agricultural. In other words, there were carrots and things. You know, you were like a, you know, whatever. You're like a rose, or you're like a artichoke Sim or the, symbolism yeah the symbolism of me metaphors basically yeah, metaphors. metaphors I mean you're like a a, a rose uh, you're pretty on the outside and thorns inside I think that's a Greek song right yeah. something like that anyway but uh, no he liked uh, in music his taste was Wagner he, he loved the dr very dramatic you know operas you know yeah. uh, uh, the ring, the cycle yeah, of the yeah, ring. the ring cycle. Yeah, yeah. My mother said she once saw the ring cycle in one day. Can you believe that? Morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, How about you? I like uh, I my my father sh uh, used to take me to the Fifth Avenue Cinema, and there I saw. Big uh, uh, movies. Uh, no, we saw French movies mostly. Uh, but we saw a really great movie, Red Shoes, and I was very influenced by that. And another movie that was about dancing was called Spectre and the Rose. Not too many people know about that. It's a black and white. And it's one of these movies where art imitates life or life imitates art. Life imitates art. In other words, the ballet has somebody leaping to their death at the end. The movie had somebody doing you know, the leaping to the death. Uh, it was produced by uh, Helen, uh, what's her name, the famous actress. I went to school with her, uh, with her son, who uh, was from Hawaii Five O. MacArthur, Helen, Mac no, but her name was something else. She married MacArthur, uh, Helen Hayes, Helen Hayes MacArthur. Uh, but, uh, uh, her, one of her, her, her husband was behind that. Anyway, long story short, he knew uh, artists who were also ballet dancers, and I went to lofts in a village uh, for dancing. And that painting that I showed you earlier, uh, the boat, was at a cor uh, a dancer choreographer's uh, you know suburban uh, getaway next to a mill stream, which ran all night long. Uh, during the hurricane, uh, and in 1982, uh, I took a young woman who I was fond of, who was very well connected, uh, and I wanted to impress her to the New York City Ballet, and I've been going for 42 years since then. Wow. <laughs> when is the last time you went to Greece? And last time I went to Greece, I took my grandson uh, at age 12, which is uh, now uh, 10 years ago. What Greece uh, we went on the, meant to you? Because you're an American of, of some Greek descent. Yeah, well, I, you know, I certainly... And also as a historian. Which well, I friend, I'll give an example. History, yeah. Give you an example, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the headmaster of the elementary school I went to, his grandfather was Edward Everett, who was the, the great, great Greek Fidelin, scholar. Yeah. And he was a great Phil Elaine and yeah. also, you know, Harvard College president, senator, governor, you know, you name it. Uh, but, uh, so, you know, I grew up knowing from my father that you know, Greece had the great culture. Uh, I also saw, you know, how people respected him. He had a, a, a friend, Jerry Stefanatos, uh, who had a business called Candioplastic. He basically transliterated the name for, for pastry shops in Greece. Can, what was it? Say it in Greek. Yes. Sakharapastia. Sakharapastia. And uh, my father said, he started this business 
when the Waldorf was having a dinner for President Truman and they wanted to have a superlative cake. So my father would take me there when I visit. It was on 85th and Columbus. And I would eat Louis Sherry ice cream and little cookies uh, while my father for two hours would talk in Greek about the classics to this would-be sculptor, you know, pastry man. And at my Deerfield graduation, I had the most elegant cake. It was an open book. And my father carried my Harvard graduation cake on the train up to uh, Route 128, because I was over oh, my marriage, uh, the wedding cake, that was it, the wedding cake, because uh, I got married when I was in college. My, I got married my senior, uh, before my senior year. Uh, my wife was a junior. But uh, we, uh, he, you know, he was constantly in my life. Uh, I think my mother was a little upset when I moved to New York that he was more in my life now than he had been as a child. But in my, you know, my father was constantly gregarious. I did stay with him for one week after I lost my house in uh, separation prior to divorce. And uh, he tried to treat me as if I were that little boy. You know, have you tied your shoes in the morning? And I finally said, you know, I told my wife and she let me sleep on the couch <laughs> in the living room uh, until I got my apartment in the end of October, the first of October. But uh, he, what I realized is that this tremendous extroversion was a cover for feeling rather frightened as an individual. And uh, I only learned by describing my wife's uh, uh, activities uh, from a psychiatrist that I misunderstood her, her uh, acting out as uh, you know, that she was feeling very threatened herself. In other words, the relationship was threatening to what she wanted to be. You know, she, and what happened is, after she got custody of the kids, uh, she didn't come home till 9, 9, 10, and finally I said to her, uh, when my father was in the hospital, I said, you know, you don't really have to be a custodial parent to have the love of your children. And she agreed, and we told my father that the next night we were going to tell the kids this. And he died overnight that night, uh, happy probably that, you know, my children, his grandchildren wouldn't be with a former drug addict. <laughs> but, but, but he left uh, a large number of, uh, of uh, work, right? Yeah, about 350 paintings. And I keep on finding other things among things. He, he had every single clipping from a newspaper or a magazine. Uh, for example, he had three magazines from Grand Central Art, and I gave the, the late uh, uh, art dealer, uh, all of a sudden I'm forgetting his name, it's an Irish name, but he was with that guy that, uh, uh, the art dealer that was put in jail because he sold, he, he used uh, his artist's work as collateral to buy stuff in the Ponzi scheme. Uh, Salador O'Reilly, O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly, third generation in art. His grandfather had a, a art, uh, you know, an art business. And uh, so I gave him, I had three copies of something that showed his grandfather and I gave it to him, he was very touched. Mrs. Cornbley showed him the paintings that were in the warehouse, but he never, he never decided to, you know, I didn't realize she was showing him that because she was thinking of retiring. Uh, unfortunately, I've had bad luck with dealers uh, since. Uh, with uh, my first dealer after Miss Cornbley was uh, uh, was uh, Sid Deutsch, and uh, he sold a painting to a person I actually knew and went to China with. I could have sold him the painting myself. I felt that was rather difficult, you know. Uh, that I had to pay, you know, half the money to him. Uh, 
and then uh, uh, Kuros was in the thing, and we had differences of how we should sell them. And uh, then I went to uh, Mark Borgi, and Borgi never sold anything. And I later found out from somebody who I had worked with when I ran a gallery briefly with a real estate broker in Southampton, I realized how difficult it was to sell things. And the irony was when I had a, an exhibit of Costas Simaracas, an exhibit of a very good uh, French-American painter uh, who did, you know, the things you do on glass plates, uh, and a good friend of my father who's a really good artist, uh, I didn't sell anything out of those places, but during the group shows, I got two, two things. So, fortunately, I only lost five hundred dollars on that uh, old deal, but uh, it was difficult. Uh, I was working with a guy that was a total fraud. Statistics show that during the pandemic, uh, in, investing in, into paintings and art it was a uh, uh, at the rise. How, yeah. how do you explain that? Well, a lot of people are using art now as uh, uh, to clean dollars. It's a way of cleaning dollars. They, uh, they even uh, uh, buy art, they avoid paying taxes, they put them in international zones, you know, shipping con containers or whatever. There's a whole bunch of places like that. They're even doing TV programs now and movies about it. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate. I, I think what happened is at the time that my father had a chance of breaking out in the art thing, that's when Andy Warhol came along. And Andy, after Andy Warhol, it was all about marketing, because he was a marketer. He had nothing of real value. He was a good marketer. Uh, the fact that, you know, some dashed painting that somebody else did in his studio can get millions of dollars is ridiculous. Uh, but it, that's it. it. Art has become a commodity. And... Um in, in, in concluding our wonderful interview, uh, how you, not only as, as a son of, of Aristotle, but not only as a guy, but also as a historian and, and, and also a person who understands and, and, and enjoys art, mm -hmm. uh, what is, you think, the contribution of uh, Aristotle's work to the American society in terms uh, of, of, of painting? And, and also, uh, what do you like to be the legacy of your father you know, in, in, for the next generations? Well, fascinating that uh, I, I think I may have mentioned to you on the phone, but I should re reinvent it. My father learned to paint from me. I have a painting that I can show you on my cell phone uh, that my mother folded up. A guy, age two, it said on the back. It was a water. It was some kind of finger paint, watercolor thing. And uh, you know, I did paint with my father in Buffalo when he would come and visit. Uh, and I did once do a painting in his studio that he kept forever in a Fifth Avenue studio. Uh, but you know, I, I wasn't inspired to to do it. I I liked photography. But I didn't like the idea of becoming, selling photographs for money. I didn't want to, you know, it's the best photographs I've taken are not, you know, they're not saleable. Uh, and I wouldn't want to be that way. And that was the same feeling I had when I was a waiter. And I, I think my father understood that because he was named as a waiter in that uh, rest record, uh, you know, you know uh, protesting uh, uh, Sacco and Vizzetti's execution. Uh, you're, when you are waiting on table, there's a subtle reaction of the personality and the people in terms of the, uh, the thing. Un unless you're like me, who was a waiter, I constantly give 20%. <laughs> you know, I double the, uh, the payment, which is a little bit more than 20% if you consider that the tax is added in. My ex-wife would always do 18% and she would calculate the pre-tax part. I just, you know, having been a waiter, uh, and she was a waiter too. My father tried to get us to be a waiter, I mean, to run a, a restaurant, in, you know, in one of those uh, under stoop kind of places. And I said, no. You say, you have no idea. We've been in the restaurant business. 
you have no idea of how difficult it is to run a restaurant. But, uh, you know, my father, uh, you know, he always said that he would be remembered in, by other artists. You know, it's, he was a giant in the New York Art School. Uh, uh, this, uh, a book that uh, Pavia's uh, widow put together, it's, I forgot the title, uh, I'll get back to you on it. Uh, but it, the whole chapter is about my father speaking about the relationship of art to the world outside, and uh, whether uh, whether the Colossus, where the art is in the Colossus, or is it outside the Colossus, uh, and the problem I think he always saw was that uh, that especially as he became more popular, that art was a commodity, and he 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 had 21 bank accounts when he when he died. He didn't spend any money recklessly, uh, you know. So I was quite comfortable, and I was able to buy a house when I got my children back. But uh, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, my uh, my son, my eldest son, was going to uh, uh, be with him for a couple of weeks, and that fell through. But he did do something else in architecture, and he became an architect. But his son, seeing the paintings that, that my son has in his house, at age three started painting like my grandfather. So there's painting in the blood. Even a granddaughter now that's 19 likes to paint occasionally. Uh, unfortunately, uh, her introduction to painting was, was sort of bad. I remember taking my eldest son to summer school and the, the uh, painter at C.P. Hollow basically had all the students paint like him. And my father was horrified. But uh, no, it, my father didn't have, he, he had the respect of te the students. Uh, uh, he had a birthday party every year. We always went Dutch. Uh, and when my father died, we hired the Mofetis restaurant. We paid for a band and everybody paid their own way. And my eldest son, did all the communications and picking up the checks and the people actually sent money in, in, in envelopes in those days. Uh, but uh, uh, it, was a, it was a great time. And one woman complained, Dorothy Block, who was a big fan of my father, she said, this is such a happy occasion I can't cry. Uh, but that, that's what my father would have liked, you know. Uh, you know. I did go with him to a funeral of his best friend, uh, my dentist, who was memorialized in the first issue of Ms. Magazine as my mother, the dentist. Her son was Nicholas von Hoffman, who uh, had a, a, a you know, post-syndicate uh, column, uh, was on counterpoint, you know. But he, my father was his mentor, because his father was an explorer in Africa. And in this article called, uh, my mother, the dentist, the first page is all about his mother. The second page was all about my father, without mentioning his name. But when I asked him to write about my father, he says, I don't do eyepieces. Unfortunately, he died a year after I, to the day after I moved here, and it was four years ago. Uh, but uh, he wrote the best-selling uh, book about Roy Cohn that was made into an HBO thing. Uh, he wrote about his tutor that was also uh, uh, Obama's tutor, Saul Alinsky. I didn't particularly like that book, but uh, he was a very prolific author. Uh, he started in writing. He did, didn't go to college, uh, but, you know, he had my father. <laughs> uh, and my father, by the way, was very much against college. He says college makes you infantile, infantile, infantilizes you. Uh, and uh, so I wonder what he would think now about colleges where the students are so rowdy. <laughs> yeah, also uh, your experience as a teacher, uh, and now education, because of the advances in technology, uh, it, it is some kind of uh, a lot of influence there. 
what, what do you think about the future of education in our days? Well, I think the COVID time had an opportunity to do something, but the, unfortunately the school districts weren't able to, uh, to be creative and bring the students together, uh, you know, the way that they did with exercise classes from Nassau County. Uh, but you know, my, my granddaughter went to a nursing college, Malloy College, was, she just could not understand the professors the way they were teaching on the, on the, uh, on the Zoom. And uh, she didn't do well. So she switched to uh, Queensborough College and she's going to go somewhere else. But she, uh, the, the, I think the best thing, I once saw a, a California public TV program where they mentioned the idea that uh, school should be like an art, uh, architect's studio where the students are working and sharing. And the interesting thing is my granddaughter Audrey, who started at age five in Belrose, Queens, in an all Indian neighborhood where there were, she was often one or one of two light-skinned Caucasians, uh, Koreans, Chinese, South Asians. Uh, you know, her best friends were alternately Indians, uh, Sri Lankans are Korean. A lot of her friends now are Korean, uh, but in that, they the uh, teachers would place the kids in groups of six, the desks all pushed together, so there was constantly uh, cooperation. And I think that's uh, a good way to do it. And she had very because it was gifted and talented. They hired the best teachers, and now they're doing away with the program. I don't know if you were aware of that. Do you have kids in school? No. No? You're lucky. <laughs> uh, if I were to say anything about the future of education, I think the thing to do would be to uh, get rid of the administrators. Uh, in other words, make the administrators less important. Make them uh, have the status of janitors. In other words, do the financial things, you know, review bills, etc. But uh, most of the people who rise to become principals and superintendents these days are uh, really mediocre people. Uh, my li I retired at 55, 30 years ago, because uh, I couldn't stand being told how to teach from people who couldn't even spell the word chalk correctly. Two out of three. Uh, both became superintendents afterwards. Uh, you know, it's just, it's, uh, I had one really good administrator, and he had the same background as I did, Harvard and Harvard Ed School. Uh, and as I like to say it, he was nicer than me, and he was smarter than me. But uh, when I started teaching on Long Island, it was very difficult. Uh, I either outshone people or I threatened people. Uh, you know, it was it was it was difficult. Uh, uh, you know, I think the biggest problem is we don't, we don't uh, respect teachers at, as they should be. Uh, my father always said, you know, calling on the Russian, he said, you know, when a principal goes to a school in Russia, a limo takes him there. In other words, teachers are very much respected. Uh, a guy that used to cut my hair told me that growing up in Italy, his father would always walk and catch the teacher who was walking in the evening. You know, it's a Mediterranean thing to walk in the evening. My father did a lot. And if the, he would ask how things went that day <laughs> with, you know, him. So he was very careful to be on his best behavior in school. I mean, they even in, in, in Italy, they call the teachers professori, you know. Uh, so. I, I think or, that's unfortunate. Or, or, or maestro, yeah, it's very yeah. Uh, prestigious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, as a historian, you you are very much aware that uh, the American society uh, had divisions before. 
Uh, what yeah. is your 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 uh, assessment of 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 of, car of the current situation? Is this a divided society? Is there I, is there any hope to? I think to, it is to because reconcile? what we have is people like Ron DeSantis, who's Yale and Harvard educated, acting like fools because they think that fools will relate to that, and they figure that most of the uh, the voting public are fools. Trump played, he says, I love uneducated people, a direct quote from Trump. And uh, there's a quote on the door of Malvern School District that had a big interracial problem that I reported on when I was teaching in the uh, Institute of the, the, uh, the U.S. Education in Southampton College. Uh, Malvern Elementary School, it said, uh, Education can help you, a, a person who is not educated becomes a slave. A person who is educated can't be enslaved. Something, I mean, I've, I've not paraphrased it exactly right. Yeah. But uh, The value of education. Yeah, but it, it's that, uh, you know, we, we also try to, to educate everyone the same way. The German system is the one that I've seen is the best. They take out the people like de Kooning went to a vocational education in, in, in Holland. A German kid at 11 who wants to be a car mechanic starts studying automobile mechanics. At 14, the kids that are still left in the regular school that don't see themselves leading an academic life or going into uh, professions that involve things, you know, they want to be a medical technician, they go into what is called a real shul. And I think that's a much better system. And when we had uh, kids visit from a gymnasium outside of Stuttgart to our school and vice versa, I could see that, you know, these kids were far and above even my honors class. Uh, and I know my eldest son said that when he w went to Ossining from Long Island, he took two grades in West Isop, where we lived, and he said very quickly after the f first grade, it was clear which kids would pay attention to the teacher and which kids wouldn't. And that's where the divide came. In other words, there are people who care not for learning and care not for uh, democratic governance. Democratic governance is difficult. It's a lot simpler to say, hail Hitler, and let a crazy man do all your bidding. Uh, and supposedly there are quite a few people, they're doing polls now, but quite a few people, especially the people in these, these militias, they're very happy with the dictatorship. They, that's what they so, want. So, as an educator... I'm worried. I'm worried. I think the guy down the street that's Portuguese-American is doing the right thing to go back to Portugal because I think the future for his kids is either getting shot in a school or getting past drugs in a school, you know. And so what would be your advice to, to young students or, or suggestion to... Do your best. Do your best. In other words, if you don't understand t uh, uh, academics, get learn a trade, learn something that you could do. Uh, some of the most successful people in the technology business left college in the middle of it. You know, the two most famous, you know, Microsoft and uh, Facebook uh, did that. Uh, obviously that's not for everyone, but uh, I think my father was right that college often infantilizes, especially if you just go through the motion. And the, the thing that I think is terrible is uh, the fraternities. My, my eldest uh, uh, brother-in-law got into Northwestern. He was just as bright as his sister. She got into Northwestern and he drunked out. Went to BU, got all A's, got back in. But he ended up going to graduate school in St. Louis. Uh, but he neglected to get a deferment and he ended up in the Pentagon doing health papers. And he became a radical and or helped organize the, the march against the Pentagon within the Pentagon. And unfortunately he died of cancer because he got involved 
in the outer parts of Washington, D.C. As you get into the triple alphabet, the neighborhoods get more, even the white neighborhoods get more sketchy, uh, and drugs are prolific. I think drugs are, are a big part of the problem. Guns are definitely part of the problem. Uh, I think if we do, uh, I think we've totally misinterpreted the uh, Second Amendment. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody has to have a gun. It says a well-organized militia. These, the only well-organized militias are ones that are traitors, seditious. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I, I just hope my grandchildren can, can seek out good lives. But uh, I'm not as confident as I was when my children went out into the, the world. I think it was a, a more promising time. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Guy Caldis. And uh, I, I would like uh, to uh, document in, in public uh, your uh, generous uh, gesture to donate uh, one painting of Aristotle Caldis to the Hellenic American Project and mm -hmm. Queen's College. And thank you very much. And uh, when the protocols are, are off, we're going to have a great event at Queen's College okay. to memorialize that. And also, I would like you to know that Queen's College, either the, um, um, the Benjamin Rothschild uh, uh, Library or uh, the Hellenic American Project Library and Archives, would be more than glad to accommodate you to catalog uh, uh, some of the archives okay. of the family that, that, yeah. that exists and uh, to take care of it. And we hope we will continue writing and publishing some books uh, on, on, on you and your, on your father. That would be great. Uh, 